Hello everyone and welcome to Nature Life Online. I'm going to be your host for today. My name is Christine. I'm really looking forward to this show. If you've been following our shows online, thank you so much for being there and watching. Uh, but if you are new to Nature Life Online, let me tell you a little bit about these shows. Now, these live shows are opportunities for the Natural History Museum in London to bring its collection, its sciences and the stories from behind the scenes to you, to your home. We do them every week and we invite our guests to talk about those museum secrets, those museum collections uh, and tell you more about them. Now, they're also live, which means that you can interact with us. You can send your own questions during the show by popping them on the chat on YouTube or on Facebook and we'll try to get through as many as possible. Now, also, we uh, would love you to enjoy these shows and if you are enjoying them, we would love uh, to uh, we would love you to make a donation if you're able to do so. It doesn't matter if it's big or small, we always appreciate it. And you can donate by uh, clicking on the button that is on the YouTube chat, uh, chat, or you can go directly to our website. And we'll pop a link in our chat as well, so you can check it out. Any donation is always really, really appreciated. Um, and yeah, thank you for that. Now, today we're going to be exploring the world of pterosaurs. Now, these flying reptiles have features in countless of books and uh, films with dinosaurs, but they sometimes get overshadowed by the likes of the T-Rex or Diplodocus. Now, we, today we're going to be putting pterosaurs on our focus, on our spotlight. And to talk about them, we've got a very special guest today. Is uh, Today's joining us, um, to talk about pterosaurs, Kieran Miles, who is a conservator at the museum and works with a lot of specimen um, over there. Now, Kieran, you've also done a lot of science communication and uh, shared the, your knowledge with the public. Today, we're going to be focused about these amazing animals and I'm really, really looking forward to that. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, how are you doing? Yeah, thanks, Christina. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, yeah, I'm doing all right, thanks. Good to you. Brilliant. So let's get straight to it. Let's start talking about uh, these fun uh, fascinating animals. And the first question to kick off this, this talk is, what is a pterosaur exactly? Okay, yeah, so pterosaurs are an extinct group of flying reptiles. Um, they are quite notable by having these uh, big wings, of course, being supported by one hyperlong finger. Uh, they were the first vertebrates to evolve powered flight. And no, they're not flying dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> although, yeah, um, there is such thing as flying dinosaurs. Uh, we call them birds. So <laughs> crows, sparrows, pigeons are flying dinosaurs. Pterosaurs are not, they're their own unique group. Absolutely, so, okay, so they're not flying dinosaurs, Kieran. So how are they related to dinosaurs exactly? Yeah, so having said that, they are very closely related to dinosaurs. Both dinosaurs and pterosaurs uh, belong to a larger group called the archosaurs, or the ruling reptiles. And the modern living archosaurs are the crocodilians and the birds. And we think that dinosaurs and pterosaurs are actually the two closest branches on this tree. So they think that they're each other's closest relatives. So you can think of them as cousins, if you like. And they probably evolved from the same common ancestor sometime in the Triassic period, and then split off and evolved along their own separate lines. Absolutely. So a, a different group, even though we see them together quite a lot. And that actually leads to my next question. You know, were they alive at the same time that dinosaurs then? Did they share the same time periods, roughly? Yeah, pretty much the same time. So um, they lived during the Mesozoic era. The Mesozoic is the span of time that um, from about 250 million years ago to about 65 million years ago. And it uh, encompasses three time periods, the Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. And both pterosaurs and dinosaurs appear sometime in the Triassic, lived through all the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. And then sadly, uh, all the pterosaurs got extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, along with most of the dinosaurs. We'll talk a little bit about that. Now, my next question, uh, Kieran, is, now we, we, we might be used to seeing a particular stereotypical pterosaur. It's the one that I've got in my necklace. Yes, uh, it is a pterosaur. I put it specifically, specifically for that, so thank you for the question. But there were a very diverse group of animals, right? There were many different kinds of, of pterosaurs, right, Kieran? Absolutely, yeah. So they're a tremendously long-lived and successful group. They had about 160 million years of evolutionary history. And as you can see, they're extremely diverse. 
We know about 150 species. Uh, this was probably a fraction of the actual diversity because they're actually very rare to find as fossils. Um, but as you can see from this amazing artwork by Mark Whitten, who's not only a really talented artist, but also a genuine pterosaur expert. So you always know that his paintings can be based on the latest evidence for pterosaurs, which is great. Um, you can see there's all sorts of different shapes and sizes. There's um, ones with toothless beaks, there's short snappy jaws with teeth, uh, all sorts of fancy head crests, shorter long tails, different wing shapes. Yeah, very, very diverse group. That's amazing. And that's not that what we see in this image is just a, a tiny bit of all the, the might have existed in the past, right? Yeah, I think we've got one representative of most of the major pterosaur groups. Uh, so each one of those actually represents a whole <laughs> uh, load of relatives. We'll be, we'll be looking at more closely at that diversity, at different aspects of, of their morphology, of their characteristics. Um, but one thing that is really important about pterosaurs is that they could fly. Now, they had a very specific a way of taking off, right? And it's quite important for, for, for them, for this group of animals, right, Kieran? Uh, yeah, there's been lots of different ideas and hypotheses about how they could have taken off over the years. I think the most convincing one by far is called the quadrupedal launch method. And in this method, they kind of uh, whole vault into the air. If you imagine sort of hopping over their front legs and then using the powerful front legs to push up from the ground, launch themselves into the air. There's a brilliant uh, video actually of how this might have worked on the NHM website showing the pterosaur and anguera uh, taking off using this quadrupedal launch. And this is actually quite interesting because it gives them a bit of an advantage over birds uh, because birds are bipeds. So to take off, they need to launch themselves into the air with their feet and then they take over their wings. Um, this means they need powerful back leg muscles to uh, for take off, but also powerful front uh, wing muscles to carry that extra weight as well because once in the air those takeoff muscles are then dead weight and uh, so there's a bit of a trade-off there over which muscles they can make bigger and it kind of limits uh, how big a bird can get and still fly. If pterosaurs are using the same muscle groups to both take off and fly as they would be if they're using this quadrupedal launch that means they can skip leg day at the gym and just go all in on the chest shoulders and back muscles pack those with muscle and that gives them the potential to grow to really, really large sizes. That's incredible. I really find that amazing, Kira. Just this, this how the way they work help them that like, shapes the different sizes that they wear. Actually, leads to my next question: How big could they get? You said that they could get quite big, um, and they had this um, advance. How big were they? We we can see a photo here that might have some clues of how. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, as we saw, they're a very diverse group and there were lots of different species with lots of different sizes. The smallest ones could have fit in your cupped hands. But uh, the largest species, uh, they all belong to a group called the Ashdarkids. And these things are enormous. So the largest flying animals ever existed. Um, so uh, I think the biggest ones, the wingspans could have got up to maybe 10 or 11 meters. Um, and they could have stood about as tall as a giraffe. Uh, I should point out the little dinosaur they're grabbing there is a baby dinosaur. They weren't this enormous um but yeah this is uh, <laughs> um the probably the most famous giant pterosaur quetzalcoatlus uh, which is from texas which is great because everything's bigger in texas and these are some of the largest pterosaurs ever found and That's he's incredible. in europe this is cryodracon from um canada it's just recently been named another of these giant pterosaurs it's just i they amaze me and the more i find about them the more fascinated by them uh i am now we can see in that picture i'm glad that you specified that that was a baby um dinosaur that was in a whole um a whole diplodocus or any of those sauropods big sauropods there but um we can see them hunting there and, and eating how how did they hunt and what sort of things would they have eaten kieran well again going back to the diversity we see so many different um jaw shapes and teeth types or and some with no teeth at all that really suggests that there are lots of different diets going on in all the different species so these giant ones are probably what's called terrestrial stalkers striding around the ground just kind of grabbing any small medium-sized vertebrates they could find um, but there are other pterosaurs that look like specialized fish eaters like perhaps this pterosaur hana anguera you can see is the teeth form a really nice sort of fish grab when they come together um, and then there were pterosaurs we think might have been vulture like scavengers uh, maybe some were specialized on catching insects or in flight and some pterosaurs might have been probing the sand and mud to uh, fish out worms and things and then there's this beautiful beastie here pterodalstro from argentina um, which is kind of like a flying toothbrush 
Uh, it's got, just in the lower jaw, there's about a thousand bristle-like teeth in there. And the idea for this one is that perhaps it was filter feeding, a bit like modern flamingos do, maybe uh, filtering water, maybe picking up brine shrimp and things like that, just like flamingos do today. And this is a nice piece of speculation because if they were feeding on brine shrimp, this is actually what gives flamingos their pink coloration, the, the pigment that builds up in these uh, shrimp uh, then um, sort of expresses itself in their feathers. So perhaps Pteridalstro is pink as well, as if it wasn't beautiful and weird enough already. That's amazing. This has become, I only found out about it this week, and this has now become one of my favourite animals of all time. <laughs> uh, just the fact that it's just like a flying whale or a um, flamingo or something like that. It's just amazing. It's really beautiful. And it's, it's incredible how much we can see how animals that have different habits, like the way they fit, can look similar, even though they're not related at all so that's that's incredible uh now Kieran, we're getting loads of questions but before i go into them uh we've been talking about what did they hunt but did anything hunt them were they eaten by any other animals yeah we've got evidence uh about three cases at least of um, them being eaten by meat-eating dinosaurs um there's evidence of a large spinosaur having taken one and then there's evidence of two small dromaeosaurs including velociraptor it's possible that in these cases they were scavenging on big dead pterosaurs because Velociraptor, as you probably know, is actually a pretty small dinosaur, it's about the size of a greyhound, and the pterosaurs they might have been eating looked pretty big, so they might have just been eating dead ones. Um, we do know that sharks and some large predatory fish ate pterosaurs on occasion, so some pterosaurs might have landed on the water surface to feed, maybe even done shallow dives, and from there perhaps sharks might have launched up and taken them as they sometimes do seabirds today. And this is an incredible fossil from Germany shows a predatory fish on the right, a Spidorhynchus, apparently having speared right through this pterosaur Ramphorhynchus. Um, and both of them have died together. And it's just an unbelievably well-preserved fossil. It's from uh, the Solenhofen region in Germany where you get these amazing fossils. And the reason you get these amazing fossils is because it's in this sort of lagoon where the environment was just right for preserving fossils. There's actually an anoxic layer probably on the bottom of this lagoon with no oxygen. So anything entering this layer would have died immediately or nearly immediately. So perhaps what happens is this fish kind of launched itself in a pterosaur, got tangled up in the wings and sank down to this sort of uh, layer where, where there was no oxygen at all and, and died. Um, but it's an incredible fossil. That's amazing. It's, it's incredible how you can get this snapshots of what was going on back then on fossils uh, and just then it's your your role, um, paleontologist, to actually decipher what was going on in there and find out all the information that those snapshots hold. It's, it's just incredible. Now, Kieran, as I said before, loads of questions coming from our audience. Uh, there have been a couple of questions uh, from Sophie and, um, and Doa who were asking whether they had feathers, but before I let you answer that, I'm going to say you'll have to hold on until the end of the show because we are going to talk about that, but I don't want to reveal it just yet. Uh, in the meantime, we had another fantastic question from um, our audience. Um, Joshua from YouTube, they were asking, are, are there any reasons why pterosaur fossils are so rare? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Yes, the main reason they're so rare is because they had incredibly thin bone walls. Uh, talking sort of millimeters or even less in some cases you imagine the thickness of a playing card that's the kind of thickness that some pterosaur bones got to so although they weren't fragile as such um they couldn't withstand sort of crushing forces and things like this and if you imagine say a dinosaur bone buried in the ground if something happens say some acidic process happens that dissolves away a millimeter of the top layer of that bone you've still got a dinosaur bone if something dissolves away the top millimeter of a pterosaur bone you've got nothing so yeah, that's pretty much why they're so rare. They just don't preserve well at all because they're extremely hollow bones. Oh, that's amazing. It's all related with with the ability of flying. That's that's really cool. And um, another question as well coming from our audience. Rosie was asking, what color was pterosaur's blood? <laughs> Thanks, Rosie. Uh, <laughs> I think it's fairly safe to assume they had red blood, like most vertebrates. We can look at their modern relatives, the crocodiles and the birds. And generally features that both of those animals have got in common, it's probably safe-ish to assume the pterosaurs have those as well. And they both have red blood, so yeah, that's pretty red. 
<laughs> that's brilliant so no, nothing weird like blue or green it's just standard red um brought over there now uh another question and then we'll go back to to uh our topic and we're going to talk a little bit about reproduction but before about that before that um steve on facebook uh, was asking if turtles were all extinct and they became extinct back then when the dinosaurs became extinct um although they look like birds is it actually dinosaurs that are a current bird ancestors it's just are dinosaurs birds ancestors not pterosaurs yes absolutely as far as we know um uh, all the diversity of modern birds we see today evolved from one group of theropod dinosaurs back in the jurassic and so these two groups, the birds and the pterosaurs, although they are related, they both independently evolved the ability to fly. And sadly, we lost all the pterosaurs and they left no descendants at all. Um, but birds have carried on and diversified to the sort of 10,000 or so different species you see today. But yeah, well, we I think see. birds are modern dinosaurs, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And it's important to look at them. Birds are so diverse and incredible. Although, secretly, I would love to have some pterosaurs flying around and, and be able to spot them. I would love to do that. <laughs> Now, Kieran, going back to, to um, uh, my questions, my next question was, do we know how they reproduced um, in the past? And do we have any fossils that showed us that? Mm, this was a mystery for a really long time. Um, the first pterosaur fossil was found in, I think, the 1770s. And no pterosaur eggs were found at all until 2004. And then three were found in one year, which is really surprising. Um, but more recently, hundreds of pterosaur eggs have been found in a site in China. And now we know a lot more of than we ever used to about um, pterosaur reproduction. So as you might be able to see from this fossil, the egg is kind of squashed. Um, so this tells us immediately that they're not hard-shelled eggs like birds or dinosaurs have, um, but more sort of leathery sort of parchment-like eggs that um, crocodiles and things like that have. And that tells us also that probably they were burying the eggs to stop them drying out, maybe in vegetation or in soil. And yeah, this um, site in China is preserves many, many hundreds of these eggs. And yeah, his kind of reproduction of the pterosaur Hamipteris, which is the, the colony that would have been living here. Um, maybe guarding or in the act of burying their eggs, I'm not sure. I mean, it's an incredible discovery. It is, it is an amazing discovery. And it's really cool that, I mean, that we didn't know for a long time and it depended on finding something like that to then be like, okay, now we know, um, now we have the answer. And some of them contain embry fossil embryos as well. And what's interesting about this is because they look quite well developed and they look, they've got complete wings. Um, so it's possible that baby pterosaurs could fly pretty much uh, immediately after hatching, which is unheard of in any other flying animal really. Um, so baby pterosaurs are often called flaplings to reflect this uh, idea that maybe they were flying as soon as they were born. That's incredible. Yeah, because if we look at birds and bats, they take a while and a lot of parental care for them to then go ahead and, and fly. And that's, that's amazing. Now, talking about uh, flying, Kieran, how do the wings compare to bats and birds as well? Like we've, we've uh, learned about how maybe they were able to fly from very early uh, days. So how are the wings different? Yeah, all three groups of flying vertebrates, the birds, bats and pterosaurs, all evolved the wing in a separate way. The birds, all the arm bones are incorporated into the wing and they use flight feathers for flying. Uh, bats have four very, very long fingers with sort of skin membrane between them. And pterosaurs are different again in that they've got a four fingered hand. Um, so they've got digits one, two and three as sort of ordinary fingers with claws on. And then digit four, what we call the ring finger, pterosaurs is the wing finger. This is enormously long and strong and supports the wing membrane, which probably attaches somewhere near the ankle. Um, and the picture here shows the new pterosaur. Um, it's called Cumpangopterus antipolicatus, but it's been nicknamed the monkey dactyl, so I think we'll go with that. <laughs> and this is a really interesting one because um, it's the first example of a pterosaur with an opposed thumb. The thumb is set opposite the other two digits, so it could actually form a grip. And this is the oldest example of an opposed thumb that's ever been found. And perhaps this is an adaptation for climbing around in the trees or maybe even grabbing big insects. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting one. That's incredible. It, it just it just blows my mind, Kieran, every time I hear about this thing. And, and, the, and the, the more current discoveries are also incredible. Now, another thing that uh, creates the, the diversity, and we've seen it in some of the pictures before, where the, the crazy crests that they they had, um, and that they are quite, you know, even the stereotypical um, pterosaur would have that crest. How, how, what were the crests for? What Did they have any use? Yeah, the most likely function of the crest is that they're for display. 
um, for um, signaling to, uh, you know, trying to attract a mate. Um, so it's not unreasonable to think they might have been very brightly colored as well. Um, some pterosaur species had no crest at all. Uh, some of them had a, a crest of bone or soft tissue or a mix of the two. And in some pterosaurs, all the individuals have got crests. And in some, there are separate morphs. So for instance, the famous one Pteranodon with the sort of long uh, bony crest at the back of his head. There are two types of adult individuals. There are ones with large bodies, uh, the big crest and narrow hips. And then there were smaller adults with a very, very small crest and wider hips. And it's been suggested that this represents the males and the females. The females needing wider hips to uh, lay the eggs out of, and the males needing big crests to kind of uh, attract the females and kind of show off a bit. Ah, that's amazing. So a little bit like in birds and some animals when, yeah, fem yeah, males just want to look very attractive and very, very colorful. That's, that's amazing. That's really cool. And what about this guy over here? That <laughs> looks completely bizarre and crazy. Yeah, this is Nyctosaurus. It's a really strange crest. I think it's probably the longest pterosaur crest. It looks like a huge ant that kind of off its head. Um, uh, yeah, it's a very weird pterosaur. It's also got no other fingers apart from the flight finger. So it is, the idea is that maybe it's just spending almost its entire life flying out over the oceans and probably spending very little time on land at all. Um, but yeah, this is a really outrageous crest. That's amazing. So whoever found that also might have been blown away by it. Now, Kieran, now we're going to go back to that question that has popped up a couple of times in in from our audience as well. I really wanted to ask you. So Sophie um, and Andor were asking, did they have feathers and what kind of feathers is so? That's a brilliant question. Um, we've known since the 19th century that pterosaurs were covered in a kind of buzz. Uh, we we call it pycnofibers. It's a short, flexible uh, material <laughs> that um, probably would have looked a bit like fur on a living pterosaur, short fur. Um, what's really interesting is that quite recently in China, some exceptionally well-preserved aneurognathid pterosaurs were found. Aneurognathids are these sort of small sort of Muppet-based pterosaurs, really weird little things like sort of gremlin bat things, very short faces. And these ones are so well-preserved that they can see the, the fuzz all over them uh, in quite a lot of detail. And in these ones, the, they pointed out sort of four different types of fuzz all over their body. So some of it is very simple and very straight and short, and some of it is more complex and branched. And it really does look like uh, simple feathers, Michael Proto feathers. Uh, it's really interesting because if that's true, uh, it suggests that maybe, because we know that some dinosaurs had feathers, and now if pterosaurs, if this fuzz is feathers as well, it suggests that maybe the origin of feathers is much, much older than we thought maybe they inherited feathers from their common ancestor and that the ones the dinosaurs without feathers that things like big sauropods or stegosaurs and things like that might have secondarily lost those feathers in the same way that say big mammals like elephants and whales uh, have lost the fur that their, their ancestors would have had uh, this is a lovely pterosaur by the way. this is dimorphodon from dorset uh, <laughs> it was discovered in 1828 by mary anning the famous fossil hunter though i'm delighted to say it's going to get her own statue in my region soon uh, which is great. But yeah, this is a, a nice uh, sort of smallish pterosaur. And this, this one would have been as well a bit furry and like fluffy kind of in some way, right? Yeah, we think all the pterosaurs are covered in this this fuzz uh, all over their body. Um, but perhaps only bits of the face and wing uh, not being covered. And even in some pterosaurs, even that might have been a bit fuzzy. Um, but this is really strong evidence they were probably endothermic, kind of warm-blooded animals, because this would be insulation, this would stop them losing the body heat that they're generating inside the environment. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, now, Kieran, lots of questions coming through our audience, so I'm going to uh, throw a few more at you. Um, Dylan on YouTube, they, are, they were asking, how fast could the largest pterosaur fly? So I suppose the big one. And do we know? Could we? Can we tell by just the fossils? Um, there have been some experiments, some flight experiments. People do some amazing experiments when, you know, in wind tunnels, building model pterosaurs, you know, and kind of estimating or doing some complicated maths based on their muscle masses. And I think they said for the biggest pterosaurs, the top speed might have been something like 75 miles per hour, which is very, very fast. Um, it's possible that things like the small uh, pterosaurs with broader, shorter, broader wings are flying a lot slower, but that would have given them a lot more agility. They might have been having to change direction a lot in the air. Uh, these ones we think might have been hunting insects. So insects are very, very nippy, you know, they dart around. So maybe 
being able to fly slower, uh, but having the agility to be able to change direction would actually have been an advantage for those smaller aerosols. Absolutely. That's a good question. And another, yeah, that was excellent. Another question from our audience. Again, one of these questions that said, my, my, my follow-up is always, like, can we actually tell? And Melissa was asking, how old could they get? Do we know? How old could they get? Um, I'm not sure that's known. Um, we can tell when they're adult or not, So because pterosaurs have determinate growth. So they, the adults lay down a sort of final bony layer on the skeleton. So you can tell if you find pterosaur skeleton, usually if it's very well preserved if it's an adult or not um estimates suggest that the pterodaustro that's the one with the bristly now <laughs> the mingo looking one uh, maybe it took about seven years to reach adult size but once there i don't know if anyone knows how long the adult pterosaurs would have lived if it's comparable to dinosaurs uh estimates for those usually run through from sort of 30 years to 80 years so it could have been something like that you know larger ones maybe living longer smaller ones living shorter as they tend to um mm -hmm. i don't know i'm afraid sorry it is a, is a difficult question, that one, difficult to tell from fossils. Um, we're getting really close to the end, Karen, but one last question from our audience. Um, Glenn was asking, do we have any fossils of pterosaurs that have traces of collars, like those that have been found on dinosaurs? Yeah, so the same study I was talking about where they looked at these um, Chinese uh, little aneurognathid pterosaurs, the ones which show the possible branching proto feathers. Again, they were so well preserved that they were hints of uh, what's called melanosomes. These are kind of like the cells that give, that, that contain the pigments that give them the color. So there's been some really interesting work with those on dinosaurs suggesting colors. And the ones for the little pterosaurs that they found, they look like they might've been reddish brown. Um, it might not be a great representative though, because the aneurychnathids are suggested to be nocturnal. And if you're, you know, so they've got big eyes, um, probably flying around catching insects. And if they're flying around at night, you know, they probably wouldn't want to be brightly colored. They want to be quite stealthy. So the reddish brown's quite plausible. You know, this kind of thing a bat might have to be quite hard to see in the dark. Um, so that's the only one I think has ever been found to have any hint of preserved color, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. But hopefully more more to come in the future as so we discover more of these things and new techniques as well. Now, Kieran, before we uh, wrap up, or before we finish the show completely, I've got a big question to ask you as well. Um, because, yes, yeah, sadly, at least for me, uh, we can't see pterosaurs around anymore. Why did they go extinct and say things like birds didn't? Mm. Yeah, so there was a major mass extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period. Uh, so about 75% of all life on Earth died. And it's probably got something to do with the perhaps eight mile wide asteroid that collided with the Earth in what's now the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but there's also climate change going on at this time and extensive volcanic activity. So it could be that this meteorite really did hit at the worst time for everyone. Um, it also looks like possibly it was mostly giant pterosaurs left by the end of Cretaceous. It's hard to be sure because the pterosaur fossil record is so poor, it's hard to sort of pick up patterns and things like this. But we know there's lots of giant pterosaurs at the end of Cretaceous. And it's not really surprising that they disappeared because when there's a mass extinction event, uh, large bodied animals, especially warm blooded animals, tend to be the first to go because they're slow to grow and reproduce. They need a lot of food. And they find it hard to hide or take shelter. So they're usually the first ones to go. Uh, birds, interestingly, um, in there's lots of very small ones. So perhaps um, they were being forced into the sort of roles that pterosaurs weren't taking you know, taking these sort of ecological niches that pterosaurs weren't occupying. So perhaps if birds by this point had become so small seed eaters, that would have actually given them an advantage. And in times of really hardship, like one of these extinction events, that might have been how to get through, you know, these be, be small, eat seeds, which are actually probably re still readily available on like most other foods. And so it might actually be uh, because of pterosaurs that birds are still around today, we might have them to thank. That's amazing. And with that amazing note, Kiran, uh, we've reached the end of the show, sadly, uh, because I could be talking about this for hours with you. But hopefully we'll, can, we could get you back in the future to talk about pterosaurs or any other any other topics you like. It's been, it's been a pleasure to have you with us today. I'm going to say goodbye to you now, but hopefully see you in the future, Kiran. Bye. Thanks, Christina. Bye. <laughs> Now, I really hope that people have enjoyed um, our chat with Kieran as much as I have uh, and that you now love 
pterosaurs as much as, as we both do. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for all your questions. They were brilliant. Um, and if you've enjoyed Nature Live, remember that we do these shows every week on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. And they're free, they're here for you, and you can check our, all the shows as well in our YouTube channel. As well, if you've enjoyed today, consider making a donation. Big or small, we always appreciate it. You can donate on the button that is on YouTube on uh, near the chat, or you can go directly to our website and we'll post a link to it as well. But anyway, thank you so much for watching. And thank you so much for your question. And thank you so much for being there. If you want to join us next week, my colleague Alison is going to be talking about ancient DNA. So yeah, tune in at 1pm on Tuesday and we'll see you then. Until then, bye.